Welcome back! Today on Dialed In DIY, we're looking at the basics of how to use a breadboard. This has definitely been one of my favorite tools in a DIY toolbox for many reasons. Because I use it for project experiments, electronic testing, prototype designs, and they also just make great gifts for people who are of the DIY mind. There's more to the breadboard that I use than you need for basic use, and I'm going to break that down a little bit more at the end of the video. But to start with, let's look at what a typical breadboard looks like. The simple explanation of what a breadboard is, is essentially a plug and play way to test out your components for any electronic project. So let's start off by taking a look at the main parts and how they work. We're talking about electronics, so obviously we need to hook up power, and that starts with using the power rails. You can see these marked with the plus and negative for positive and ground. Once you've hooked in the power, it, the entire rail that you see highlighted is actually active, and all you have to do is plug in to access your power. It actually works like Quick Connect, which is really kind of cool. Since we're using the outside sections for power source, we'll consider the inside sections for our components, which is why they're referred to as component rails. They're also known as terminal strips. This is where we're going to put all the components for our project. You may have already noticed in the previous images that there are five connected holes or sockets on each of these component rails. Any particular lead, wire, or component that you plug into the same node will be connected to each other. So that basically brings us to the important functional question regarding a breadboard. And that is, what do I have to do to make this work? Fortunately, that answer is actually quite easy. You're going to get some jumpers or solid core wires. I do prefer the 22 gauge because they fit the best. This particular image is called jumpers, and the wires look pretty much the same, but they're not pre-shaped. All you need to do is make sure that whatever you use has stripped ends like the wires you see here, and you're going to use those to plug from hole to hole in different nodes. My personal preference is whatever power source I'm using, I like to plug the positive on one side of the section of the board and the negative on the other, as you see in the image here. I do like to do it this way because it makes it much harder to confuse the positive and ground sections when I'm hooking my parts together. So at this point, I think the easiest way to make all of this make sense is to use an example. And one of my favorite examples is powering an LED. Usually my first step is hooking my power to the board. So I will take a positive line and hook it up to a power rail on the positive mark. And then I'll take my ground and hook it up to a power rail on the opposite side. LEDs work great on breadboards and I will go ahead and plug one down to make sure that each of the leads hits two different nodes. And then I like to remember which one has the positive connection because we're going to go from that. I will then hook up a resistor if necessary to the negative side before I connect the power to the negative rail and then the positive rail. And as soon as you get it hooked up to the positive rail, your light comes on. So for an important user tip, let's think back about how I plugged in that LED because that's important for all of our components that we plug in. You want to make sure that you don't plug both leads of an item into the same node. By making sure that you always have your leads going into two separate nodes, you ensure that you do not have much of a risk of shorting out any of your parts. Now that we've talked through all the key details for this, let's go ahead and take a look at what setting up this circuit actually looks like. The LED that I chose for my circuit here actually is rated for 3 to 3.2 volts. So I have it hooked up to 3 volts, which means I really don't need a resistor. But since I showed you how to set it up with the resistor earlier in this video, I'm going to use a space holder jumper just so that you can keep track of what we did before. I apologize for any confusion because in the video, the jumper is green, but in the image, it's orange. 
The nice thing about setting up a circuit like this on a breadboard is you can actually trace the flow of power through your circuit to make sure everything is lined up the way it should be. For each component or wire that you plugged into a node, there should be a second one connected if you have everything hooked up actively through all the nodes and all the rails. Now that you got this first circuit to run, you might want to have a little bit of fun experimenting with some different add-ons or adjustments. So let's take a walk down that path. First thing that's nice to be able to do is to add a switch to anything that you're building so that it makes it easier to turn the power on and off. Simply remove our connection from the ground line and pick a couple of nodes where you're going to drop a switch into place. Make sure you have a ground line back to one of the leads on your switch and then from the other lead bring it back to your resistor or directly to the LED if you didn't need the resistor. Push the button and your switch works. The great thing about this basic setup on a breadboard is it's really easy to modify it for a different functional component. Simply swap out the parts, get rid of the LED and the resistor if you don't need it, and say drop in something like, oh, I don't know, a motor, maybe a fan, or a buzzer. This is the point where you can start to get really creative and have some fun. It also happens to be the same basic setup that I use when I want to test out parts that I've salvaged like say things that I've taken out of my what's inside videos. Earlier in the video I mentioned that I'd get back to some extra bonus thoughts about breadboard so let's get back to the full look of my breadboard that I've been using. Right away it's pretty easy to see that there's some extra stuff here that is not on every basic breadboard. In fact mine has two breadboards in one setup. In addition to that, I've got these three binding posts which give me a great way to have extra options in connecting my power. It is important to note that these extras are not connected to each other. In fact, they work as separate items. The binding posts merely are ways that I can plug in power directly to a post, tighten it down, and then plug that off into my breadboard if I want to do that. When I was going over the component rails, there might have been something that you noted particular about these, and that is that they have these little dividers, or gutters, between the sets of nodes. This is important because it allows us, in a more complicated setup, to take an integrated circuit and drop it over the middle without having it short out. You can easily plug it into nodes that are not connected to each other. The layout of my breadboard actually gives me the equivalent of two breadboards. This way I have rails A and B that aren't connected to each other, rails X and Y that aren't connected to each other, and this board 1 and board 2 aren't connected to each other either. I particularly like this when I have a project that requires two different power sources that I like to keep isolated. Sometimes I like to save space by taking long leads on my components and plugging them into the power rail and directly into the node. I also like the flexibility that a breadboard gives me to experiment with parts so that I can see what I might want to make out of it. Such as this heat sink and fan that I pulled out of a laptop. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, but I got to test out a lot of different ways to hook it up. Thank you for taking the time today to stop by Dialed In DIY and checking out my video. If you liked it or got something out of it, let me know by clicking that thumbs up. If you're interested in some more videos like this, feel free to check out any of my playlists. And I'd love it if you'd subscribe while you're here. And make sure to come on back in the future because there'll be plenty more dialed in DIY to come.